Let's talk a little bit of Northern Virginia fashion that, well, Christmas was great, but it's over. So let's press on to the next goal in true Northern Virginia fashion. No time to waste. And I want to share a story. Um, I shared it in a couple of contexts uh, years ago by uh, Dr. Chuck Swindoll, who's a fairly well-known author, pastor, former president of mine and Marty's seminary. He has a letter that a daughter wrote to her parents while she was away at college her first year. And the letter said, Dear Mom and Dad, just want to let you know what my future plans are. I've fallen in love with a guy named Jim. He quit high school after grade 11 to get married. About a year ago, he got divorced. We've been going steady for two months, and I plan to get married in the fall. Until then, I've decided to move into his apartment because I think I might be pregnant. At any rate, I dropped out of school last week, although I'd like to finish college sometime in the future. And her parents read that and quickly went on to the second page of the letter where she wrote, Mom and Dad, I just want you to know that everything I've written so far in this letter is false. None of it is true. But mom and dad, it is true that I got a C in French and I flunk math and I'm going to need more money. I love you both very much. <laughs> That's a very smart college co-ed. Uh, you know, seen from the correct perspective, even bad news suddenly sounds pretty good. <laughs> That's why the same circumstances can be interpreted so differently by different people. So much of it depends upon where you are coming from, what your perspective is. Now, perspective is defined as a particular attitude toward or a way of regarding something, a point of view. And in the art world, if you had two parallel lines, uh, either in a drawing or a photograph, we have a photograph of a uh, train track here somewhere that I'll use as an illustration. Um, if you're standing in the middle of the train tracks, you can tell that they're parallel lines. Therefore, they can never meet. They should just go on in infinity and never meet because they're parallel. But from the perspective of looking out on the horizon, they in fact seem to diminish, grow closer together, and actually touch on the horizon line. It's all a matter of perspective. And you see that when you're drawing. And so I hope that as Christians, we begin to see things correctly in relation to their importance as they happen to us in this life. It's a matter of perspective, and it comes that the longer that we commune with Christ, the longer we stay in his word, the longer we obey him, the longer that we fellowship at a good church of maturing believers, then we start to gain a better perspective about just about anything in life that you're going to encounter. You're able to distinguish big and eternal picture versus smaller and temporal picture. You're able to tell what's primary and what's secondary, what's important and eternal versus what's trivial and fading. Now, I like my personality type. I like to take the changing of the year as a time to pause, reflect, and take perspective of my life. And I know that a lot of people uh, like to do the same thing. At least financially speaking, they take the end of the year and they'll do some rebalancing on their investment portfolio, swapping out assets to achieve a better balance so they can pursue their financial goals. Um, you think about sports world. They have a seventh inning stretch for a reason besides just you, the fan, up in the stands to stand up and sing or something like that. There isn't a football game that they don't have a halftime just in case the coach needs to take everybody back to the locker room and help them with their perspective about what's happening out on the field. And so I don't know how we could just rush into the next year here as this one's rapidly coming to an end unless we pause, take a knee in the march that we're doing through this life, take out our canteen, drink some water, pull out your map and your compass and look and plot and reshoot the azimuth that you're marching along. And while you're pausing, look backwards, look forward again. 
because it's only after we've seen where we've traveled in the last 365 days that we can really, really uh, apprise and appraise ourselves about how am I doing here in the present? What do I want to see happen in the future? And so as I'm on my knee drinking some water, looking at my map and compass, one of the first things I notice is life is short. You figured that out yet? Especially during a pandemic year? I mean, I've always known that time was finite. I knew it as a child. Winston Churchill, I think, had the same weirdness, and I call it a weirdness about myself, um, or maybe almost a weirdness, don't get too excited, BCC staff, settle down, but it is a kind of a weirdness about me that I've always been aware of time, and Churchill was the same way as a young man, he would actually say out loud to people, it's passing, it's passing, and they'd look at him like he was nuts and say, what is passing? And he'd say, I don't know, but it's passing, and I've had that same sort of intensity a lot of my life. I'm very much aware of the passage of time. I've been aware of it ever since a young man or even a child. I mean, let me give you a weird way my brain thinks. If you live to 85 years of age, you get to live for 31,000 days, give or take 20. Uh, when you're 18, 31,000 days sounds pretty long. When you're 80, not so long. How many years until maybe you become 70, 80, whatever. Like I said, uh, time marches on. It doesn't stop for anybody. And it's interesting. If you work for the government for an, any time at all, and I did for 30 years, they'll give you different personality tests. A Myers-Briggs test is a uh, favorite with the government. And... Um, it's supposed to be so you can learn to work together with one another and appreciate the differences uh, with one another. And so there's some personality types I've discovered, particularly a type called an ENFP. Uh, don't take offense if you're one of those. God love you. Uh, they seem to have this attitude toward time that time, well, we'll just make more of it. We always have plenty of it. And for an ISTJ, I think, do you realize how wrong that statement is. You get the same 60 seconds in every minute. You get the same number of hours in every day. You get the same number of days in every week. You don't just have more of it. It's a finite commodity. Now, God loves ENFPs who think like that because he sure made a lot of them. I found out over the years or something as I encountered them. That's why I'm aware that they think like that about time. But I... Look at the scripture and I get a very different view. In Psalm 90, it speaks very frankly about the passage of time. Psalm 90, verse 4, first part of verse 4, says that your life is passing like yesterday when it passes by. Second half of verse 4, as a watch in the night. Uh, verses 5 and 6, that your life is like grass, it sprouts and it withers. Verse 9, it's going like a sigh. Verse 10, soon it is gone. I mean, you get this sense that the psalmist is recognizing that the clock is always running. Ecclesiastes 12.1, where you had the wisest man outside of the God-man Christ, you had Solomon uh, writing and recording there. In Ecclesiastes 12.1, he tells you, Remember your Creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come, and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. A few verses later, verses 6 and 7, he tells you to remember God, remember him before the silver cord is severed, the golden bowl is broken, and the dust returns to the ground it came from, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. I'm under no delusion that unless the Lord comes and raptures his church away, that I'm going to be the first Christian to ever get out of this life alive. I will not. Neither will you. Psalm 39.4 makes that point where the psalmist pleads, it's a prayer. Lord, let me know my end and what is the extent of my days. Let me know how transient I am, the implication, so I can live wisely. 
Job, when he was suffering in chapter 7, uh, chapter 8, he, chapter 7, he said, My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle. Chapter 8, he said, For we are only of yesterday and know nothing, because our days on earth are as a shadow. The psalmist, once again, in Psalm 78, says, And the Lord remembered that they were but flesh, a wind that passes and does not return. And then and even in the New Testament, James writing his epistle, Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You're a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. So I don't think I have to pound this point much more. The scriptural view is life is short and it passes quickly. And it certainly, going on to the next point as I'm sitting here looking at my map and my compass, trying to evaluate gain some perspective. Life is not only short, it's uncertain. Anybody going to disagree with me on that one? Changes, moves, transfers, sickness, pregnancies, losses, death, promotion, demotion, successes, setbacks, surgeries, weather storms, pandemics, loves won, loves lost, marriage, investments, wars, Rumors of wars, the number of years that we get with those that we love, life is uncertain. Go back to that James 4 passage again where it spans, starting with verse 13 this time. He tells you, come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we'll go to such and such a city, and we'll spend a year there, and engage in business, and make a profit. But you do not know what your life will be tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. So stating the obvious, life is short. And you don't know any more than I do what tomorrow holds. And so it's certainly uncertain. And so you're coming here post-Christmas to church and you're thinking, thanks a lot. I was feeling pretty good <laughs> on the holiday season until you got up there and started talking. Are you going to give me any hope? What's, what's the point of coming to church if I don't get a little bit of hope along the way? And yes, yes, I'm going to give you something to cling to here as we pivot toward the present. Hang in there with me. Because I find that to recognize the truth about the present while you're surveying the past year and trying to look forward to the future, you have to realistically look at kind of a clinical view at truth. And so here's the third truth. Life is not only short, it's not only uncertain. Here's the third truth that I want to share with you today. And there's such good news in this. Life is challenging. It's short, it's uncertain, but that is one of the things that makes it filled with challenging possibilities and challenging adjustments. When Jesus promised an abundant life, in John 10. Who doesn't want that? I came that they might have life and might have it abundantly. Sounds great. He is our abundant life. He is the one, when I look back through the lens of history, that has leveled out the road for me so much, made my path so easy, took care of me and my family. He is my abundant life, and he has made my life abundant. But have you ever looked at the context where he makes that promise to you? that he's your abundant life, and that he came that you could have it? Look at the passage in John 10, verses 7 to 10. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep, and all who came before me are thieves and robbers, and the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I came so they would have life and have it abundantly. The promise of abundant life is only through Christ. If you don't know Christ as Savior, you have no real hope of an abundant life. But he is the abundant life for those of us who have accepted his payment, who have accepted that he, the innocent, died for me, the guilty that believe that he resides in me in the form of the Holy Spirit, that he leads and he guides me. He is my abundant life. 
But that promise is made, as Christ is talking about it, with an active enemy around in the midst of thievery, killing, destroying. That ought to tell you right there that life is going to be challenging, even in the midst of an abundant life that he offers to you. This is real stuff. These are harsh words. Thievery, killing, destroying, and yet he offers an abundant life to us. And the more we linger in his presence, the more we study in his word, the more we find the abundant resources for whatever challenges of life we face. His very first sermon in Matthew 6, he said all this, it's going to be so familiar, but it illustrates the point of what he's saying. Matthew 6, for this reason I say to you, don't be worried about your life as to what you'll eat or what you'll drink, nor for your body as to what you'll put on. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the sky, that they do not sow nor reap nor gather crops into barn, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more important than they? And besides, and which of you by wearing, can add a single day to his lifespan. And why are you worried about clothing? Notice how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor, nor do they spin thread for cloth. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all of his glory clothed, clothed himself like one of these. And if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not worry then, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what are we to wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, but your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, and all these things will be provided to you. There's your asthma. Seek first his kingdom. Don't worry about these other things. He knows you need them. He'll provide them. And so then he ends with verse 34. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Get that? See how he just tied that in with the abundant life that he promised you? He gave you a, a guarantee about that abundant life. Each day will have enough trouble of its own in the midst of the abundant life that I'm giving you. I used to read that and I think, really, Lord? That's it? That, that's supposed to be an encouragement to me that every day I will have enough trouble in that day? Having walked with him for a few years now, I recognize that in a fallen universe, how could I not have trouble every day? But I have him, my abundant life. Each day will have its own challenges, but if I linger with Christ, if I seek him, if I talk with him, if I listen to him as he talks to me through his word, it's amazing how words that used to frighten me more as a younger man lose some of that power. Words like danger, fear, impossible, watch out. They don't seem so overwhelming anymore, having walked closely with Christ, having listened to him through his word. This last year, one of the things that I wanted to do was to try to be filled with his spirit more moment by moment every day. So I made it a discipline, been doing for the last year, that whenever I wake up, I tend to wake up early and usually without an alarm going off. And uh, I'll lie there in the bed for a moment and I'll thank him for another day of life. My ceiling in my bedroom is white. I'll thank him that that's how he sees me, that I'm clean from all my sin because of his sacrifice. I'll ask him to fill me with his spirit so that he's going to be walking through me, talking through me, ministering through me as I meet each day's challenges and problems because each day is going to have enough trouble of its own. But now I'm asking him, stay in front of me as I encounter those challenges, those struggles. You know, it's interesting. Whenever I first started that exercise about a year ago, I was probably pretty hardened to a lot of things in my life, uh, sin and other things. But you pray to be filled with the Spirit every day. You pray to walk closely with Him. Suddenly, I was confessing sin left and right. It was like nonstop. 
<laughs> I'm very much aware how out of alignment with the spirit of Christ I was. And at first that was a little demotivating, but then I realized, no, he, he loves me. I can't do anything to make him love me anymore. He died for me a couple of thousand years ago before I ever committed my first sin. He already died for all of them, even the ones I'll do today and next week and whatever. He loves me. He loves you. Perspective. It's a viewpoint. <laughs> Laura and I have been married for a little bit over 40 years. We are the perfect couple eyesight-wise because she doesn't see very well uh, in the distance, and I can't read anything six inches in front of my face. And so uh, as a married couple, we can usually get through most of the challenges of reading something on the spot or something, whether it's me squinting up close, her looking this way or whatever. But when she drives and I'm riding, uh, I can see down the road. So I will suggest... <laughs> ways that she could maybe she should get over in the, the lane here she hasn't seen what I've seen way down the road but I've realized uh, even though I think I'm being helpful I obviously do it poorly it, it doesn't seem to be very well received whenever I'm offering that help to her because of my superior distance vision Christ the eternal one is the only one who really sees with an eternal viewpoint. And I really don't want to argue with him about how I drive my short, fleeting, uncertain, and challenging life. As that country western theologian Carrie Underwood would sing, Jesus, take the wheel. And that's what I sense praying to him every morning before I put my feet down on the floor. Take my life, take the wheel. Talk, walk, work through me. The abundant life he promises and offers with all of its challenges, need to adapt, alter, alter things, shift and change. I, I don't speak French. Laura has a phrase about the joy of living. Many of you know it, but perhaps that's where that joy of living comes from. And the optimism and the eternal motivation that you could have if you choose to have the perspective of the eternal one by letting him live his life through you. At the end of my 31,000 days, if I'm given 85 years, what will it have been that sustained me in the midst of brevity, uncertainty, and challenges? I already know. In the temptation of Christ in the wilderness, he told the devil, hey, man doesn't just live by bread alone but by the words of God. That's how you really live. So whenever I'm closing up my compass here, folding up my map, getting ready to go into the new year, I need to make sure that I'm measuring my progress, both this last year and what I'm hoping to do today and in the future against the word of God. That's how you really live. It's not just bread alone. It's by the word of God. So I want to close with a few verses as I plan to head into the new year. And this is the sort of challenge I'll give to myself. How am I doing as I look at this? The Apostle Paul writes in Philippians 4, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Have I really grown enough that people would say, well, you really do live that. You really do seem content. Romans 8, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Is that really true? Would you say that's true of my life? Would you say it's true of yours? Or do we constantly, when we have something unexpected that we don't like happen, do we just instantly act like God just made his first mistake and he made it with me? Paul writing again in 2 Corinthians, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed sometimes, but not in despair, persecuted, but we're not abandoned, struck down, but we're not destroyed. Is that how I handle 
the problems I faced last year, this last year, was this last year difficult? How did I handle it? Would you say that that described me? Would you say it described you? Peter writing says, And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you've suffered a little while, not pretending that you're not going to, when you do suffer for a little while, he himself will restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Whenever I suffer, do people have a sense that I'm trusting Christ in the midst of the suffering? Paul writing in Galatians says, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Do I simply persevere? I love the psalmist who writes in Psalm 37, because it's true of me now. I've been young, and now I'm old. Yet I've not seen the righteous forsaken, or his descendants begging bread. Am I gaining perspective? And finally, the words of Christ himself. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. I would hope that I had more peace in my life this year than the year before. I would hope I would have even more peace in the year that's to come. And if my prayers are answered, people will see that peace and recognize that it's from God Almighty. Let's pray together. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you've given us yet another year. And as this one is coming to a close, I pray that we would be wise and that we would draw close to you our very life and certainly our very abundant life that we might learn from you, and that you might help us to gain perspective, to do a good evaluation, to learn, and then simply to let you live your life through us moment by moment. We ask it in your name. Amen. Thank you for your faithfulness to come. I wish you a wonderful uh, rest of the week and a happy new year. This ends the service.